Yeah. I like hey, <laughs> yes. Hey, good evening, everybody. This is um Jeffrey DeRose, director at the CSI Tech Incubator. And thank you for joining us with our latest tech talks. We have our guest speaker today, um, Adaku. Um, Doc, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Okay, I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Adaku Wachuku. I am an IP and transactional attorney, technology attorney, and I also am a data privacy and cybersecurity attorney. And to give you a little bit about myself, I am a recent founder. Also, I started my own legal practice um, about one year and six days ago. <laughs> so um, I previously worked at Cooley uh, LLP, which is a national um, large law firm that catered to that caters to tech companies, big and small, um, and they have a special startup practice. Um, so I decided to start my own practice to give you know my clients and potential clients um, expertise, my expertise in the licensing and transactional area, as well as the data privacy and cybersecurity area. Um, while at Cooley, I got my, you know, I, I learned um, about data privacy and cybersecurity, sort of a uh, trial by, by fire when there was this new law coming into effect called GDPR in the EU. Um, I worked with a partner, um, his name is Andy Roth, he's now, um, he went off to be a chief privacy officer at Intuit. Um, and uh, we advise clients on how to become compliant in this new uh, regime in the EU, which is now three years old. And after that followed other um, privacy laws, including the California uh, Consumer Privacy Act. And um, I worked on data breach. Um, so, you know, all of these hacking situations that you guys hear about with companies, there was another one I heard about, Robin Hood, that had um, a data breach. So I worked um, at Cooley with clients to assist them complying with the regulatory state and any applicable federal laws, um, you know, when those types of things happened. So I'm here today to sort of talk to you guys about what data privacy and data security is. And I would love to have, um, make this really conversational and less of a I'm presenting and I'm lecturing you and hopefully be able to discuss issues, answer questions that you may have while giving you some really interesting information regarding, um, you know, this area of data privacy, which is very important for all types of um, companies, big and small, you know, when you deal with uh, customer information or, you know, intellectual property even so a okay. little bit about myself yes uh thank you so much for that introduction adaku and i guess you know yeah today's topic as she stated you know we're going to be talking about um maybe just the legalities if that's a proper word around like you know data privacy for your users if you have um uh an app or even if you have like an e-commerce store or a website where you're collecting um user information i think it's important to know like you know what are some of the laws around handling that information well, what could you could be liable for if you're ever hacked or had a data breach? Um, so, you know, typically we have a uh, more of a conversational fireside chat format. We're going to do things a little different tonight. And um, Adopted, I'm going to give you the floor to go and, you know, share your screen and start your presentation. Yes. And um, I am just want to give the uh, disclaimer that um, I think for this presentation, to keep it a little bit light, I have a lot of slides. We'll go through them quickly. Um, I'll, you know, give you guys some information and then ask questions if needed. Otherwise, um, I would love to get to a point where we can just ask, you know, ha have me to answer questions and have a nice dialogue. So with that, let me share my screen. You know, while you're getting that up, I just want to give a quick shout out to our uh, promotional partners. Um, thank you to the NYC EDC. Thank you to the New York Tech Alliance. And thank you to Better Mousetrap. 
for uh, supporting us and, you know, helping bring all of you guys into the room tonight. Here we go. Okay, so this is going to be a little bit about data privacy and um, cybersecurity as it relates to business owners and entrepreneurs. Um, and there's a lot of information, you guys. So I definitely, you know, don't expect you guys to memorize and know this. This is just something to sort of whet your appetite a little bit and um, and give you an introductory um, information about this area of, of the legal landscape that you guys may um, have to consider. So there are different types of privacy, different categories of privacy. Um, there is information privacy, which is what most of you guys will be dealing with um, when it comes to your businesses, information privacy. And then you can imagine broader areas of a privacy communication privacy, like having uh, privacy talking on the telephone or communicating through email um, or instant messenger. And then bodily privacy, you know, you think of like search and seizure. Um, police officers have to have certain, you know, they just can't come and, you know, start searching you. You know, you have a right to privacy of your body. There has to be, you know, some overwhelming interest for them to do that, right? And then there's territorial privacy um, when that relates to um, um, when that relates to your environment. So your a child's locker may not be a, at a school may not have privacy, but your home you have a privacy um, expectation there. So those are the fundamentals of privacy and where privacy law stems from. Um, in order to have a fundamental uh, privacy fundamentals, you have to think of an individual's right to privacy, how you can control um, information and the information life cycle, you know, your collection, your use, your storage, and your disposal of that potential confidential private um, information. And then, you know, managing it with um, some type of security, physical, or um, technical type of security. And information security, and when you hear information security and cybersecurity, pretty much that means the same thing. And this will relate more to businesses that have um, online presence, um, or you store your data online. Um, so even if you have a storefront, but you, you have all of your customer information in the in a cloud somewhere, you're going to have to be aware of and hopefully implement, you know, information security, cybersecurity. So um, information security and cybersecurity have different aspects. Um, you have the confidentiality of the data, you have to keep it limited. Um, access. So the whole world's not going to see it. Maybe a subset of your employees are going to see it. The integrity of the data. So whenever you're holding that data, you don't want it to be corrupted. You don't want someone to go in and change it by accident. So there's a way you have to maintain the int integrity of that data. Again, whether it's, you know, customer data, um, intellectual property, um, your finances for your company, all of this data, all of this information is important and you should consider taking steps to secure it, maintain the security, uh, integrity of it, and then having it available is very important. Some of the most problematic data breach situations are those where a hacker comes in and locks the system for a comp so that a company can no longer use it, <laughs> it's no longer available to them. And that company has to pay that hacker millions of dollars to regain access to their um, you know, system, their information. Different types of security controls that all companies have to think about when they are protecting their data, 
their um, you know, intellectual property, anything that you consider that should be your confidential information. You have physical controls, which are locks. Security camera is considered a type of physical control that you have. Administrative controls um, would be your training your employees on, for example, not having a phishing exp um, a, a, having a phishing attack successful for your company. You say, what's a phishing attack? Phishing, P H I S H I N G, is when a someone pretends to be, let's say, the CEO or the founder or the HR rep or the CFO, and sends information to an individual from like a fake email, asking them to transfer money, transfer data, um, send confidential information, and they're phishing, phishing for information. Um, so a, a very important thing, depending on your type of, um, depending on the type of company you have and information that you have, is train your employees um, on how to avoid certain types of security situations. And here is um, administrative is, you know, training your employees, technical. Now, hopefully all of you guys have some sort of technical controls going on, even on your private e, uh, computers and with your own personal information. If you do your taxes on your computer, right? You will have a firewall, antivirus software, um, and companies have access logs where they can see who accesses certain systems and who accesses certain information. Um, of course, some of these are more sophisticated um, types of security that occurs with more um, regulated companies or larger companies. But something you guys should always think of as you're expanding your business. Um, so now privacy laws um, are have pretty much been around for a long time and every country, nearly every country has privacy laws. And this is where the government is telling you what you have to do when it comes to protecting certain types of personal information. And it usually, usually relates to personal information of your employees and, uh, and or your customers. And um, when you ever read data protection law is the same thing as privacy law. Um, so again, safeguarding. So you guys can read this. So I'm gonna try to get through these slides a little bit quicker, but I think it's always great to just have a, a general understanding of where does privacy law come from? What does cybersecurity mean? How do the two relate? And cybersecurity and privacy laws do have an intersection when it comes to um, state data breach laws. Again, these are privacy laws um, from each state where they're going to require you to have the things that we talked about a couple slides ago, these access controls that are technical, physical, and administrative controls to protect um, the information you guys have. And that could be personal information of your customers or find, you know, including financial information. So um, just want to check in and see if anybody has any questions so far. Um, I'm definitely sounding like a teacher, but I think this is important. So again, this is just a little bit of background. Um, this is a presentation that I've given to other people, but I'm, I'm just gonna try to get through this a little bit quicker so I can get to the juicy part, <laughs> which is telling you all of the laws that hopefully none of you guys are violating right now um, when it comes to data privacy um, laws in the US and um, globally. All right. So this is going to be important for you guys to understand uh, data breach. We hear about this all the time in the news. Um, person, uh, personal information is disclosed, is accessed, is stolen um, by an unauthorized uh, user or individual. Um, usually, if that personal information is not um, encrypted and it's just at rest and it's unencrypted and someone gets access to, even just having access to it 
not, and 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 um, copying it, stealing it, all of that is considered a data breach. And in all 50 states, there is some sort of law that requires companies to protect your pers the personal information of your consumers. And if there is data breach, you have to now report that data breach. Um, there are caveats. The caveat being um, you have to report it only if you hit a certain number of individuals. So let's say in the state of New York, you have a data breach. New York will say, um, you, if you have X amount of New York residents that are affected by this data breach, if you hit that number, you have to report it to the individuals and you have to report it to um, potentially the state attorney general. Depending on the type of personal information that's disclosed, let's say it's social security numbers, bank information and password information to certain accounts, you will have to also disclose that you had a data breach to a uh, the credit bureau and then give information to um, your users on how to you know change their get some type of uh, um, um, credit reporting or credit monitoring system in place um, I would assume many of you aren't ready for well I'm not let me not assume a lot of times small businesses don't hit this milestone. But one thing that I have discovered in my practice is that a lot of small businesses that are doing a lot of um, online transactions or they have mobile applications that are easily accessible to the world, you can really start getting tens of thousands of customers tens of thousands of users, maybe even hundreds of thousands of users. And then if there's ever a data breach, you may be affected even though you're still a relatively small company. So because of technology and you know all types of um, mobile applications and websites are easily accessible to the, to the globe really, it's important that you guys sort of be aware of potential pitfalls and try to avoid them. So a lot of data breach laws exclude, a lot of state data breach laws exclude certain types of information because there is a federal law, a federal US law that already restricts everybody's use of that information. Um, so if you've heard of HIPAA, that relates to medical information that is um, acquired by doctors, um, insurance providers, and the companies that are their service providers. So HIPAA, you know, you can't disclose a person's medical information um, without their consent. And if you do, there's fines involved. And GLBA is Graham Leach Bliley Act, which deals with the financial records and information um, that banks and other financial institutions have to protect. And if they there is some type of data breach, there are, are penalties associated with that as well. Um, one, one really great thing to do if you can, it's expensive, but if you can do it, it's highly recommended. And that is to encrypt your data um, redact informa uh, confidential information, make it unusable and unreadable. And if you do that, if someone accesses that information, it's not considered personal information and you don't have any liability in that situation. All right. So depending on the state, they have different definitions for personal information and they have different types of penalties. Um, many of the states have a private right of action of individuals to sue a company if their information, if that individual's information was, you know, hacked and there, and that individual had um, certain damages.
All right. So one of the things that as a company you always want to consider is if you do get into that situation where you've had a data breach, um, depending on your industry, and, and so if you are a mobile uh, um, on online retailer and somehow you, your personal data of thousands of customers is breached or you are fintech or, or social media app and personal information that you've collected, it's been hacked, you probably, first thing you wanna do obviously is stop it if, if, um, if at all possible internally, stop it, find um, cybersecurity, um, technical counsel to help you remediate that situation, but also um, it, it, it might be a great idea to reach out to an attorney who works in the area of data breaches um, and get, you know, verbal, have verbal discussions versus um, written reports. All right, so that was sort of the crash course in <laughs> data privacy, cybersecurity. Um, also one thing, recommend cybersecurity insurance. Um, I have cybersecurity insurance as an, an attorney in, um, for my law firm. If you save any information in the cloud, um, if you have any, any way that you have an online presence and people submit and, and, and upload certain types of information to your platform, maybe that, that may potentially be um, confidential. You may wanna consider getting cybersecurity insurance and make sure it's going to be, it's gonna adequately cover the type of business you have. So, you know, $50,000, cybersecurity insurance may not cut it if you are collecting social security information and financial bank records, right? All right, so one other consideration is um, your third-party vendors and uh, your third-party partners and your um, vendors when it comes to privacy. You have to vet them and some um, laws, um, the EU, you know, rec strongly recommends, if not requires, I can't remember off the top of my head, that you basically make ensure that your vendors, if they're also online and, you know, maybe they're provide SaaS, SaaS ser software as a service um, to you and they access your uh, confidential information, you may want to make sure that they have maybe stock to compliance or maybe they you know, have certain, they encrypt the data when it's being transported, things of that nature. So think, think about all of those things as a small business owner, startup. Um, th these are things I've had to consider as well. Um, so I definitely understand. And data privacy, cybersecurity, again, is um, one thing that every company, no matter what industry you're in, has to really consider. Um, so far, do we have any questions? I'm going to get into privacy laws next, but do I have any questions for cybersecurity? Yeah, um, we actually had a few questions come in. Um, let me go to them. Um, I think uh, Ling Chang had the first question. Ling, do you want to unmute yourself and you can ask your question out loud? Sure. Hi, I'm sorry. I'm trying to find the button. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a B2B fintech startup. So I'm wondering if any of these laws, how do they apply to businesses? Because um, it seems to me that these, what you discussed so far has been pretty much for consumer facing B2C kind of uh, situation. Right. So is, do you, so it's B2B. So you are receiving and <clears throat> collecting the potentially the financial records and other personal information of your partner's customer? Um, actually, my customers. Yeah, so my customers are businesses also. They will provide their business information right. along with their financial information. Okay, okay. So in this, in this respect, you, there are no consumers that are, there aren't any consumers involved in the transactions. Is that correct? That's correct. correct. That's correct. Okay. So you may be in a great position <laughs> because if, if, 
if it's now like B to B, most of these laws for that I've I've mentioned and that I will mention a little bit later. So the state data breach laws, and then some of these other federal laws um, really relate to personal information for a consumer. One of but a lot of the same processes that I mentioned with respect to the uh, control access controls for you know administrative um, controls, the the physical and um, the technical. Those are things you want to do because if you have a large company, they still want their information protected, right? Their employees' names are still considered personal information. It may not get you in trouble with respect with any of these laws, but it's going to be that relationship you have with the company. Um, and um, I was going somewhere with that, but but just generally, it's it's going to be a, a less of a consumer issue and more of a reputational issue, and less of a you know breaching law issue, and again that reputational issue. And I would recommend you do get um, cybersecurity insurance because that proprietary information you're receiving from your business partner is going to have a financial value. And if it's potentially disclosed, there may be liability. Got it. Thank you so much for the advice. Yes. You're, you're welcome. And oh, thank you for your question. And that reminds me, all of the information that I am presenting to you guys today is not legal advice. It is for informational purposes only. Um, if you want to um, actually get real legal advice, always go to a qualified attorney um, who will be able to get all of the data and facts that you know deals with your position specifically, and then they can um, you know rely on uh, analyze it and rely on that data. So this is just for information, making you guys aware you know, helping you guys to do additional information and ask the right questions when you do speak to attorneys, when you do speak to cybersecurity, um, technical people who will help you. Um, so, you know, everything I'm saying is, a, is an assist. It is not the actual, you know, final word in this, but let's continue with the questions. Okay, yeah. thanks. Thank you, Ling, for your question. Um, we have another question. I hope I'm saying your name properly. Uh, Quint Few Win. If you want to unmute yourself, and I, I pray I said your name properly. Forgive me. If I did <laughs> yeah, uh, you you pronounce my name very well. Thank okay. you. Um, so thank you for the presentation so far. Uh, I have one question that is like I'm wondering whether there is any global law or something that is going to protect all the data around the world. Like if there's any breach in certain country, there is some kind of global law that would um that imply to that kind of breach? Right. So currently there's no global, like one global law for a breach where if a breach happens in Antarctica or Australia, that law will apply. Right now, globally, it's very jurisdictional that um, I can tell you a very, very, very important international law. Um, if you do work on the international uh, stage, that's very important. It's called the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, from um, the European Union. Um, it's probably the strongest data privacy law that's out there. It The EU informs all of its... Um, the EU is basically telling all companies in the world, big or small, if you actively market and, and um, you know, provide services and products to our residents in the EU, you have to comply with certain um, internal requirements and regulations to show that you are, um, that you're a reputable company when it comes to security. So again, there are the requirements to have those administrative, technical, and um, physical controls in place. They want you to have like a something called a written information security plan. Um, it's, it's 
basically saying this is how we control this these are the processes and pre procedures of how we maintain the security of our sensitive information of our confidential information and if there is some sort of data breach these are the steps that we take to remediate or fix the data breach and um you know then we have processes in place to notify um the users if if required under you know the eu law um that basis is um pretty consistent um across across um the united states when it comes to the various state laws with the data breach um but the thing that sets the eu apart is they require companies to actually get the prior consent of a consumer to collect the data before that company ever collects the data, unless the company has some uh, legal purpose, lawful purpose for doing it, like complying with a contract or public um, uh, service. So the EU is really strict. Now, let's look at the United States very quickly. The United States does not have a national law. If you compare that to the EU, the EU is not even a country, right? The EU is a lot of countries that are, you know, under the umbrella of a, you know, of a sort of governmental regime. And they have a law that's applicable to all of the countries within the European Union. The United States <laughs> does not even have a national federal privacy law. We have specific federal, we have um, federal laws for specific categories of information that, um, you know, we consider private. That would be the healthcare, HIPAA, uh, GLBA, financial, um, for financial institutions. Um, so that'll be financial records as well as name, address, email address. And then, um, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, that's, you know, all of the companies that collect certain information from you guys, from anyone, um, that is a federal law. Then they have something called COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Again, um, hopefully I'll get through, let, let me go to my next slide actually. We actually have one more question um, before you go to the next slide. Yeah, no, my next slide, if it would work with me. Oh, sorry, let me just close this up. Um, yeah, so that so these are some of the US federal laws that, again, there it's piecemeal. It's not like one cohesive law that says across the board, this is the US law on privacy. We have specific categories, specific laws that focus on categories. So um, no global privacy law, just jurisdictional privacy laws. And then in the US, it's state specific. Thank you so much, Ada Kafu. You're welcome, thank you. Yeah, yeah, actually there's two questions. I have a question and um, someone else has a question, but I'll give the other person's question first. Uh, Christina said her mic isn't working, so I'll just read it out loud for her. Um, her question is, she is wondering, um, how are companies held liable if employee information is breached? Is it different than a consumer breach? Thank you. <sighs> good question right um so employees right are so in, in such situation if the employee themselves like discloses their own information while they're at work on social media you know maybe that doesn't apply but if someone in the hr department who is supposed to maintain the privacy and maintain the security of the personal information of employees, if that HR employee does something, you know, negligently, they're working on behalf of the company. So you company uh, X or CEO or president of the company, one of the important things is to make sure you have the technical securities in place, you know, the virus protection, the firewall potentially. Um, you also have to train your employees. Hey, this is how you use the computer. Don't make this mistake. Um, this don't fall for those phishing emails. 
So as a company, you're responsible for the conduct of your um, employees. So if you, an employee is in charge of the personal records of other employees because they're in HR or for some other reason, someone else in a different department is dealing with employee records, it has to be protected the same way you protect consumer information. Um, this specific, what the actual liability is and the penalties are, will be state specific. So what maybe one state won't, you know, it won't be considered a data breach. You may, you may not, there may not be a private right of action, but it's still something to consider. Um, employee information is still their personal information and it should, and a company should protect that um, and ensure that the employees that have access to that information protects it. Yes, thank you. That was a great um, response. Um, I had a question. You mentioned the thing about like third party vendors. Um, so hypothetical situation, right? Let's say I have an e-commerce site. Yeah. I process transactions through PayPal and PayPal gets hacked somehow. And um, like, you know, my customer's information was stolen, you know, um, am I liable okay. or? So it depends. Um, I'm sorry, that, that's a joke. That's, that's the number one attorney answer, right? Anytime you ask a question, the answer is it depends. Um, so it does depend on what your contract with that e-commerce, uh, uh, with that vendor says. A lot of times as a smaller business, as a startup, you, you don't have a lot of leverage in negotiating the terms of a contract. So keeping your fingers crossed, you're working with companies that are relatively reasonable and will have language that, you know, they may indemnify you if there's a breach on their end. If I was negotiating a contract on behalf of my client with a vendor, I would ensure that if there was some sort of data breach that that was the fault of or that came from the vendor, that vendor is going to indemnify my client, you know, the company. Indemnification, if you don't understand what it means or if you haven't heard of it before, it means if, let's say, I am company and I'm the vendor and Jeffrey's the, the company, I will indemnify Jeffrey. I will pay for any damages, any losses, any lawsuit that somebody, um, a third party will sue Jeffrey for if it, if it is because of a data breach. So he'll come back to me and say, look at the contract, you're indemnifying me for any data breach that's your fault. So then I will now have to help with the litigation, pay for the litigation, participate in the litigation potentially, um, or um, pay for a settlement, you know, participate in the settlement negotiations. So in contracts, you hopefully have that language that says you will be indemnified by your vendor if it's their fault. The other way to protect yourself as a company is to get that cybersecurity insurance and then ensure that that cybersecurity insurance will cover you in the event of um, you know, a, a, a vendor, or what may happen is that your insurance company you know, will say, okay, we're gonna sue that vendor. So that th those are the, the ways, hopefully you can protect yourself. Number one thing is work with vendors that are reputable. Um, and then, you know, even if the best companies in the world still get hacked, make sure you have the right contract language, make sure you have um, cybersecurity insurance. Okay, great. Thank you. I, I don't think we have any more questions. Right. So I guess you can, you can continue with the presentation. Yep, yep. Yeah. So now this is getting into more specific um, areas of privacy laws. Um, you know, what I discussed earlier was data breach, which pretty much applies to every industry. 
uh, any company that will collect personal information. And I just wanna remind you guys, um, if I didn't mention it already, personal information is a very broad definition. Um, certain states, it's even broader than, <laughs> than you know, the, the, the standard term, but it includes your name, um, your, it could be a username also, bank information counts, account and password information, um, social security numbers, obviously, driver's license information, your IP address is also considered personal information in many jurisdictions. Um, the cookies on your computer is considered personal information because it tracks you and it can basically identify um, about identify you. Your location, if you if your mobile application that you are selling tracks people's location, they, that geolocation is also considered an individual's personal information. In certain states, biometrics like an eye scan, a fingerprint is also considered personal information. Medical information is considered personal information. Your right now, my beautiful face um, in the screen is considered my personal information. So if you're a company that collects images of users and individuals or video of those individuals, that can be considered personal information too. So um, a lot of people think personal information is just your name, address, and phone number, and email address. It's those things and a lot more falls into that. Now, when we talk about the federal privacy laws, it really now focuses on at least the, the first three that are mentioned, and I should have probably added another, um, which is um, the Federal Credit Reporting Act. Um, and that goes hand in hand with Graham Leach Bliley. That's for financial institutions and any organization that is getting a credit report on you. They will get everything from your, you know, your, your credit report, which is considered, you know, personal information under uh, the Federal Credit Reporting Act, obviously the, the standard name, address, email, um, your any type of history, you know, your criminal history, um, your, your housing history, where you used to live, all of those things are information that under the Federal Credit Reporting Act is considered um, personal information if, and they, and companies in that industry have to protect it. Graham Leach Bliley Act focuses, focuses primarily on like banks and other financial institutions. So of course, name, address, email, you know, the standard information, and then your financial records, credit card information, bank account numbers, things of that nature. Um, again, they have to protect that information. And if they're and in all of these categories, if you, if a company, uh, you know, negligently because they're not putting in those security measures in place, or even if they have a data breach, they can be liable. Um, <clears throat> I do want to say one way of mitigating um, liability is um, fixing the issue as soon as possible. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, if you're able to, Excuse me, if you're able to like have the data encrypted and remember what I mentioned before, encrypted, redacted, made unusable or unreadable, you know, that's the best that you can do. That's the best thing to do um, when you're storing onto any type of information. So COPPA is the Children's Online Privacy Act, and that deals with um, children under the age of 13. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I did um, a little bit of research the other day when I was doing my presentation and I saw TikTok. I love TikTok. I no longer have TikTok on my phone because I think they're collecting, I think China's collecting my information. They said it and I don't not believe it. My children have TikTok and my children had TikTok before they were 13. And I'm sitting down, attorney that does data privacy and cybersecurity, looking at my children like, how in the world did you get TikTok? Because no one asked me. So under COPPA, 
you have to, if you collect the personal information of children, again, their image, their video, their name, their username, their date of birth, geez, date of, you know, all of that personal information, if you collect it from a child under 13 without verifiable parental consent, you can get in trouble. Now, verifiable parental consent is something that is very onerous to get. It's very, um, it, 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 it has a lot of, um, it's not an easy process, in other words. Um, you, there, I've advised clients on COPPA, and that is sometimes getting um, an email, sending an email to a, a parent's uh, email address and having them call the company back or send, pay certain services by a credit card because the idea is a, a child won't have um, access to a credit card. I mean, if you have a bad child, maybe that child's gonna get your credit card, but we're just assuming good children here. Um, so the children won't have access to your credit card. So they will, you know, that is a way of showing that, okay, this is an adult that gets come from, um, that, you know, adult is able to verify that they're consenting to this company collecting their child's data. Other ways of doing this is requiring parents to fill out certain forms. Um, it's, it's really going to be specific on your technology and what your business model is and how you interact with the children to determine the best way to implement the per, you know these procedures to collect the data uh, to collect the permission from the parent before you ever collect the personal information and that is that's very difficult and TikTok um, settled with the Federal Trade Commission. I think it was $71 million a couple of years ago for violations of COPPA. Uh, COPPA. And um, so um, the other federal law is HIPAA, Health Insur Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Mentioned it briefly, um, and that deals with the protected health information. And that's primarily in the medical field with doctors and nurses, everybody in the medical field who pretty much you know, get some type of medical information from you. And, um, you know, they use, they process information through insurance. And also insurance providers are subject to HIPAA and any service providers that help those entities um, process the protected health information uh, are subject to HIPAA. Um, so, the Federal Trade Commission is the agency in the United States that will pursue enforcement actions against companies that violate these laws. Um, and it's a private, it's a civil action. So you don't necessarily go to jail, but you can pay tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars, depending on the severity um of you know and the um, the severity of the violation you know meaning is it you know a couple hundred tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of you know individuals violated um now can spam and tcpa are two other areas that are really i put them as federal privacy laws but it's really a consumer um, consumer protection laws. So can spam is about what types of emails a company can send to its customers and what requirements have to be in that email. <clears throat> and also if someone unsubscribes, making sure you don't resend marketing materials to that individual if they say, I do not you know, want to get information from you anymore. And TCPA, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, is about text messaging. And text messaging prohibitions are stricter than the email um, prohibitions. Um, with text messaging, you're not allowed to send text messages to individuals for marketing purposes unless you've got prior consent from that individual. 
um, in my presentation on Monday, I gave the example of seeing an, a commercial. Um, I think it was like a pizza commercial that I saw. You see the commercial and it says, we have this new deal, two for one. If you want this deal, text, you know, two, two for one pizza. Um, and then you text whatever it is to that number, then you'll get a text message back the act of you sending that text message is the permission. <laughs> so a lot of companies don't know that you cannot text marketing materials without the prior consent of the individual. And um, there are a lot of companies that have to pay tens of thousands of dollars because there are actually attorneys out there that like to sue companies that violate these laws. Um, <clears throat> so I've given you like a really quick overview of these federal privacy laws, and I would love to answer questions at this point before I go any further. Um, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Ismail had a question. Ismail, if you want to read your question out loud, he actually had a good one. Yeah. Um, hey, Dr. This is for the, um, the COPPA. The COPPA yeah. law. So in reference to your TikTok, so um, to my knowledge, like anyone could create an email, lie about the age, make an account, register for whatever service. So if we have a company that's like, say some kind of social media type of platform, like would we be liable if this child lies about their age to create an account or sign up to our platform? Potentially. <clears throat> So what happens is that there needs to be this pro so as a company, if you know, if you actually target children, let's say the Disney website, um, you know, they'll have videos, they'll have, I, I remember when my kids were little, they would, they would have all of these videos and the cartoons that they actually watched. So they know children are watching and using that website. Now, if they wanted to collect data, like an email address or take a picture of the child to use in some fun activity online, they would have to get the prior consent. If you have a business that caters to children, then you're already on notice because you know if you have a cartoon or you have like something that kids are doing, um, anything that is explicit or you should know will attract children to your social media um, you know, platform or your website, you have to now put in place those uh, consent requirements for the parent to provide the verifiable consent. Now, if I am a, you know, a law firm, maybe there's that one kid that wants to be a lawyer and went on my website and put in their email. There's no way that I can really know that kids under 13 are going to be, you know, going on my website. So I have more of an argument to say, don't, you know, I didn't know. One of the things that a company can do to protect themselves a little bit in the example of my law firm is in my privacy policy and in my terms of service, I'll say this is not, you know, this is for individuals 16 and over, 18 and over. And, uh, you know, we do not collect the personal information of children under 13. And if we, and if you, you as a user um, know that we have collected the information, personal information of a minor, let us know and, you know, and, and let us know, send an email to us, call us at this number. That's what you can do. But if, if you try to say, eh, I don't think, you know, you know, kids love, kids under 13 love your technology and you're going to pretend that you're ignorant to that fact, that could be po potentially problematic. So it depends, it really depends on what that technology is what that social media platform is. All right, thank you. Uh, can, can I ask one other question? Because I don't see another question in the chat. Um, going back to personal information, uh, I didn't know like a, a recording or an image of somebody would be considered personal information. 
But for example, for like an event tonight, um, on our registration form, we have a disclaimer at the bottom, you know, the event will be recorded um, by signing up, you agree to give permission. Is that good enough um, as a form of consent? Um, I'm going to say, um, any information that I provide to during this <laughs> is for informational purposes only. Um, it, it, it should be, right? And the great thing about this platform is if I'm an individual and I say, you know what, I don't want to be recorded and I don't even want people to know who I am. I can change my name. I can turn the camera off. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I'm not quite sure if that language is in there too, but someone, a reasonable per person knows that, but that having that information, I think is, is, is great, is spot on. All right, perfect, thank and, you. And, and um, yeah, that it, in essence, an individual can, <laughs> can opt out themselves. Um, and we, yeah, yeah, I, I have to think about it a little bit, but I think it, it, it's, it's sufficient from a biz just for informational purposes point of view <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you thank you you, you can continue on with that yeah all right so <clears throat> i pretty much talked about everything um um i i do want to bring to people's attention some really important state privacy laws um <clears throat> One in particular is the California Consumer Privacy Act. This is called, this was called when it was being um, drafted, the, the GDPR for the United States. Um, this is something that may or may not impact, um, you know, the business owners and entrepreneurs on this Zoom call, but it, I think whether or not it impacts you right now, it's great to know this is what I need to keep in mind as I grow or, you know, as, you know, if you merge with a company, if you all of a sudden have an influx of, of users and those users happen to be in California, um, it's definitely, or, or if your business model is one where you provide services to other companies and those other companies deal with the consumer uh, consumers in information in various states across the, the, the country, then definitely important for you guys to know <clears throat> these pretty important state privacy laws. Um, CCPA went into effect 20, 20 January 1st 2020 and New York Privacy Act went into effect I think May this year. <clears throat> Let's see. Um international privacy laws to be aware of. I told talked to you guys about um European the European Union General Data Protection Regulation GDPR. Um, as you guys know, the UK, the United Kingdom, Britain, whatever, um, is no longer part of the EU. If you guys recall what was in the news a lot several years ago, Brexit. Um, but because the UK had been part of the EU during the GDPR regime, uh, they, their requirements are very similar <clears throat> to GDPR, the EU GDPR. And also EU cookies directive, the EU, it's the e-privacy directive. This is why we see those cookie banners pop up every time you go to a website. It's this, this um, e-privacy e directive, AKA the EU cookies directive that went to effect. Basically, as I, I mentioned earlier in the presentation, cookies are a way of identifying a person. Um, cookies are stored on your computer. There are different types of cookies. There are cookies that you use those cookies. Cookies are, I, I don't know what to call it. It's just some something that is on your computer that helps the website 
identify you, helps you fill out information like on a form if you're buying something. It's, it's a tool websites use to, to facilitate your use of that website. And a lot of times it stores information. Um, some cookies end and are deleted once you close out the website. Other cookies are stored on your computer for a certain amount of time, months, years even. Um, and what happens is when you, and you guys may realize this, you go to another website or you go back to the website and like all of your information pops up automatically. You don't have to type in your name anymore. You, you know, the information that, you know, the, the items in the checkout are still in there, even though you close the website, th those are cookies. And what happens is the cookies identify your computer and by identifying your computer, just like identifying your IP address, it can identify who you are. And since that's the case, cookies are also considered a type of personal information. And so it's required that in the EU, before you collect an individual's personal information, you have to get their consent, unless there is some lawful purpose for collecting their information. When it comes to cookies, is there really a lawful reason a company should just collect your cookies information without your permission? No, not really. So they have to get your consent. So you have to say, yes, you can, co you can collect my cookies for this purpose, or you'll say, no, don't collect my cookies for this purpose. And in the EU, even if you say, no, don't collect my cookies, they still have to let you use the website. That's not necessarily the case in the US, but it, even in the US, some websites won't let you choose. They'll say, hey, these are the cookies we're collecting. Just wanted to let you know, if you don't want to, if you don't want us to collect your cookies, don't use the website, right? So every cookies banner, every cookies is uh, policy is not created the same. And you guys probably noticed that if, if you even care <laughs> and, and click on it. But I, I would suggest just, just for an experiment, go to different websites and look and see how the cookies banners and the preferences that you're able to uh, click. If it's um, maybe a smaller company, maybe they don't have, you know, it, it'll be like a US cookies versus if it's like a big company, it'll be a, you know, a EU cookies where you have to say, yes, please, um, I accept you are allowed to collect cookies. So that's, that's interesting. Um, and as you guys build out your websites for use in the US or internationally, because again, like, for example, e commerce is something where, um, you know, I, I buy like, all sorts of things that are coming from different countries and individuals in the US here can sell their products to all areas that has you know, some type of courier or delivery service that goes to that particular end user. So if you have a website and you are now marketing and providing services to certain, to people in certain jurisdictions, these are things you have to comply with and uh, if not, at least consider to see if, you know, if you have to comply with it. Um, <clears throat> all right, so I, I, I did say a lot already about um, all of the different types of federal laws. Um, and, I'll, and I'll just go into a deeper dive, but I'm, I'm, I can take additional questions because it's really, at from this point, just a, dish, a repeat of what I've already said. So are there any questions? Okay, no questions. So let me turn this over here. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you, Ishmael, for like, defining everything to make sure everybody <laughs> understands what I'm saying. I appreciate that. Just just a couple couple of the terms. No, I appreciate that. That's great. Okay. So, all right. So I think that is it. So we talked about Papa Graham Leach Bliley. Um 
you know, I, I just have more specific information that if, if anyone has specific questions on these issues, I'd be happy to answer them. This is just sort of like the, the teacher's list of information. You can take notes if you want to. Uh, <laughs> um, here's an example here of the what's considered protected, protected health information for HIPAA. It, it, you know, it has the IP address, medical record information, vehicle identifiers, you know, <clears throat> biometrics, biometric information, date of birth, death date, admission date, those are things that are considered protected health information. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, the privacy rule and the security rule are now, it goes back to what I said at the very beginning of the presentation, those requirements to put in place administrative, physical, and technical safeguards, right? M those technical physical and administrative measures to protect the data, whether it's protected health information, personal information, um, and uh, the security rule requires now the service providers to also be um, subject to HIPAA. And yeah, so that's it. This just fun facts. These are numbers to get you guys scared so you comply with the laws so you know penalties can spam um i can talk a little bit more about can spam um i think i i brushed over it a little bit so this is the requirements for sending email marketing you can send an email to individuals for marketing without their consent initially this law says what you have to do, however, is in your headers, in your email headers, you can't be deceptive. You can't say something like, you've won a, a free vacation to the Caribbean. And then someone clicks on that email and then it says, yeah, go to this link to pay for the services, you know, to buy this thing and then get qualified for, you know, an, a, a drawing for the trip. You can't be deceptive in your marketing. Um, pornography is not illegal, it's legal. But this law requires that if you do send explicit content via email, you have to put it in the email header. Um, I'm only mentioning that because that's part of the law. Um, and this and this, interestingly enough, one of the reasons why this law came into effect is because many, many moons ago in the early 90s, for anyone who's old enough to remember, um, that used to be a problem with explicit content coming into emails, and it would make it seem as though it's a normal email, you click on it, and all kinds of nonsense comes up. So that's one of the requirements, can spam, but that but now it, apl it applies to every industry and every business. So the headers have to be um, correct and not deceptive. You have to have an, a way for users to opt out of your email. So a lot of times, if you look at the bottom of an email, it'll say unsubscribe. So you, when you're sending the marketing information, hey, I have information about this new service I'm providing. And then at the bottom, you'll have something that says unsubscribe either by <clears throat> responding to the email or the unsubscribe uh, button will take you to a website where you put your information into unsubscribe. It's important that if you do have this mechanism in place, you keep track of the emails that are unsubscribing and do not send marketing to those emails after they've unsubscribed. I believe there are service providers e that, that provide email services for marketing. Specifically, you guys probably are aware of it and they can assist with complying with some of these laws. But if you are sort of trying to do it yourself, just be aware of this, this particular law. Um, interestingly enough, you should have an, a physical address included. I believe PO boxes are acceptable. Um, and I think that's about it that's worth mentioning here. Um, again, if you do violate the law, the Federal Trade Commission um, will levy fines. Um, and in this case, 
$11,000 per violation. And for can spam, a state attorney general can now sue a company on behalf of its uh, residents for um, any actual damages that occur up to $250 per violation. So per violation could be per person. And you, you as a mark, sending marketing material to thousands of people. So that can add up. Um, and then can spam, you know, the email requirements or prohibitions are very different than the texting. Remember I said texting, you have to get that permission ahead of time. Um, the telephone, um, oh, what does this Telephone Consumer Privacy Act, I forgot what it stood for, also deals with robocalls. So robocalls, um, you should be able to opt out of the robocalls. You can go on the federal do not call list. And as a company, if you do this type of marketing, you should have an internal do not call list. Um, and do not send, do not send the text or the call to people who are on the federal do not call list. You have to check that. And then you also have to make sure um, you don't send it to people in your internal do not call list. So I think, you know what, that, that's pretty much it. I think that's pretty much it. And um, again, violations can be $500 per violation. And that can add up. The Federal Trade Commission, again, is able to uh, enforce um, enforce this law against companies that violate this these rules. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you had more to say after you're you finished with the presentation. No, it's, it's pretty much you know I think I've given a really big you have overview of cybersecurity <laughs> and privacy laws that again, hopefully it's getting everyone aware of the landscape that's out there as you're building your business so that you know what questions to ask. You'll say, okay, you know, a docu mentioned this. I think I need to keep that in mind. Um, later, you know, in a couple of months, I may have to reach out and ask a question, get confirmation about that. So this, you know, there's no test at the end. You don't have to remember it. You're not going to remember or know everything, but this is just to sort of, you know, make you guys aware of sort of the data privacy landscape and the data, uh, data cybersecurity landscape and the data privacy laws. Yes. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for such a phenomenal presentation. Very informative. Um, I personally learned a lot, as I'm sure a lot of others at home did as well. And um, I guess maybe before we wrap up, does anyone else at home have any, you know, last minute questions or feedback or want to talk about, you know, maybe uh, a particular situation they might be facing? Um, if anybody wants to have a discussion, you know, you can speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> I, th I think they're still like trying to process, process all the information. And um, on, honestly, I know this, like the, you, Jeff and I were talking about doing like a fireside chat, but I wanted to just present this because I think even in my experience, I didn't know a lot of these things until I got into this industry. And a lot mm -hmm. of times you guys have expertise in what you're doing. You're not worried about all of this other thing, uh, all these other things. And what do they always say? I don't know what I don't know. So Hopefully now you guys have more information in your wheelhouse to help you as you, you know, as you guys build your, your business. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we have a comment from Alex. Um, he doesn't have a mic or she doesn't have a mic. Not sure. I hope I'm being respectful here. Um, but Alex is looking into how um, they, they can get um, cybersecurity insurance to see if it'll be worth it. So yeah, Alex, you should definitely uh, research that. Um, a doc, do you have any referrals for maybe um, some good sources for cybersecurity insurance? Hmm, no, but that is a great, that's maybe that's something I can follow up with you about. Um, I know I, I use a cybersecurity, I use a, a security firm that specializes for law firms, but as far as companies, um, 
Jeff, I think it might be worth me following up with you uh, when I get additional information, you know, can share like, hey, these are a couple of places, uh, you know, people may want to consider. Okay. And um, is it okay if, um, if, if we shared your contact information, if anybody wanted to consult with you regarding oh, these okay. matters? Yes. Um, I have a really nice slide at the end. So I'm going to share my screen one more time. Please do. And um, also, um, I'm just, here we go. Hey, that, yeah, you know, um, usually after one of these events, we send a follow-up email with like a, a link to the recording. Would you be open to sharing this deck with whoever attended tonight? Yep. All right. Perfect. Yeah. So, so we'll, we'll share your contact info and yeah. your, um, and your deck and your website as well. And that follow-up email. So yeah, if anyone um, wants to have like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a Daku, um, you know, feel free to reach out to her. And just once again, thank you everybody for coming out tonight. I think we had a, a really good crowd. You guys are pretty engaging. Um, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You did a great job with Daku. Very thank informative. You. And, um, I hope everyone has a good evening. So I'll let everybody get back to having their, their evening and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you guys. Have a great day. Have thank a great you, night. Daku. Have a good night. Okay. Bye.